Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show. I'm so excited to have Dr. Cher back on to talk about follicle and egg stimulation considerations for women with diminished ovarian reserve. Recently, Dr. Cher joined me to talk about preventing poor embryo quality in IVF. I asked him to come back and share a little more, very specifically about what we need to consider when doing ovarian stimulation in women with diminished ovarian reserve. Thank you. Let's start with some context here. What do we need to know about egg quality and how it declines over time? Well, let's give you some statistics. If you take a woman of in her early 30s, and this we did, two out of every three eggs in her ovaries before they're even subjected to a natural cycle of stimulation have the potential to produce good quality, competent embryos that are chromosomally euploid, meaning all 46 chromosomes are present because she's young. But through wear and tear, the older she becomes, fewer, a lower percentage of those eggs have that potential. These are just guesstimates, but at the mid-30s, maybe one in two or three are normal. And when you get to 40, maybe one in five. And when you get to 45, maybe one in 20. So there's a downward slope through wear and tear. And an egg from a woman of 45 that looks normal under the microscope doesn't make it normal. Beauty is but zona deep, but skin deep. You can't tell whether an egg is competent by looking at it. Yes, you can see which ones are decrepit, but those that look normal could still very easily be abnormal because of the impact of age. And so we have to be aware that we don't shuffle the deck when we stimulate a woman with drugs nor do we deal the hand. We simply play the hand we dealt. And so we must treat every hand as if it has the potential to have winning cards. It's really important to do that. So from my perspective, I regard every woman as having the potential to produce good eggs, which brings me back to the issue of what can we do to give those eggs that are in that particular batch of eggs in the antral follicles that are going to be available in the cycle of stimulation, the best chance, if they're normal ones in them, to come out being euploid, because euploid eggs will make euploid embryos. Chromosomally normal eggs will make chromosomally normal embryos. In doing stimulation during IVF, what can we do to give the eggs the best chance at being normal? You can't use a one-size-fits-all recipe approach to stimulation. Different strokes for different folks. And it's really important to do your very best to avoid overexposure to LH-induced testosterone. And that is why when I stimulate patients, many of my patients, especially those that are older or have diminished reserve, and therefore because of the diminished reserve will have increased LH activity and ovarian testosterone, I put them onto a birth control pill to start their cycle. I don't do it in everybody. I used to, but I don't do it in everybody any longer. Dr. Scherer, can you explain for those listening or watching, why would you choose birth control in this kind of situation? I put them on a birth control pill because that immediately lowers LH. That gives the ovaries a breather and gives the ovaries an opportunity to get ready for the cycle. I then overlap my patients, my patients, all of them, with Lupron or Bucerolin or Superfact or whatever the agonist and GnRH agonist is that you can use because that increases antral follicle production by boosting the FSH. But unfortunately, it also boosts the LH. Cause the pituitary to produce more LH. It's almost like if you've got an outstretched hand with a waterlogged sponge, when you give the uh, Lupron, it's like squeezing that sponge, it all hits the circulation in mass in a couple of hours. So I continue with the Lupron It's like keeping that hand clenched and allowing the LH to dry up. So by the time the period comes, which will come six to eight days later, the moment she has a period, she's got the antral follicles from the boost in FSH, but her LH is at rock bottom. And at that point, the stimulation begins. I either continue on the agonist or I personally switch to the antagonist. And then how do you decide to move to the antagonist type cycle? What factors are involved and what else do you consider? In women with diminished reserve, 
and older women, I prefer to start the GnRH antagonist, which is cetrotide, Ganrelix, and Orgolutron as examples. They're the same. I will start the antagonist on the very first day of stimulation, switching from the agonist to the antagonist, from the Lupron to the cetrotide or Ganrelix. And then they will continue on it, and I'll boost them with FSH-dominated gonadotropins. I will use the, the recombinant. It's not pure FSH, but it's a 95% FSH, as compared to Metapure, which is roughly 50-50 LH and FSH, and I use a limited amount of that, especially in older women and women with diminished reserve. And I start stimulating at a high level, and three days later, I drop the FSH level down by about a third and continue with the Metapure. If you're going to use an antagonist, you've got to add some LH component because there'll be nothing left. And without LH, there's no testosterone. Without testosterone, there's no estradiol and then no follicle growth and egg development. So I always add back up to 75 units of Menopure. For people in Canada, there are other alternatives of pure LH that you can use. But Menopure is fine as long as you don't take the dosage too high. And then I continue on that reduced dose of FSH, recombinant, and the Menopure for about another four days. And then I start doing daily ultrasound examinations and blood estradiol levels. And I watch the estradiol level go up, watch the follicle growth together. Ordinarily, you'd expect each follicle over 15 millimeters to contribute 150 picograms to the total estradiol, maybe 200. But if you're on an antagonist alone, it can be lower and falsely lower. You've got to watch follicle growth and the trend in the rise of estradiol. And when I get a couple of follicles that are 18 to 22 millimeters, but not more, with the rest of the follicles, half of them being over 15 millimeters, I then trigger. What triggers do you use in these situations and why? I trigger with HCG, recombinant or HCG. I do not use uh, Lupron triggers on women with low ovarian reserves. There's no need. The whole reason for using Lupron to trigger or Bucerolin is because you want to avoid ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, which it does do. But the problem is when you give something like Lupron, you don't know how much LH the pituitary is putting out because that's how it triggers meiosis. The pituitary surges the LH and then you start getting the maturational division with the reduction in the chromosome number. So what I do is I try my best to limit the use of Lupron to women who we know are at risk of severe ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And even then, I often prefer to use coasting. How do you use Lupron? Use a small amount of, L of HCG with it. Don't give the Lupron alone because that will give you, protect the woman against OHSS, but at the expense of egg quality, therefore embryo quality. So I prefer to give them HCG. Only time I'm concerned is if the estradiol is through the roof or they have more than 25 follicles, then I might coast or I might use some Lupron with the HCG. Otherwise, I use HCG alone because I tell women if they don't have too many follicles, they're not going to get OHSS. Right. And if they do, it'll be mild and it's self-limiting. And since we test the embryos to see if they're normal anyway, they're not going to have the transfer in the same cycle. They're not at risk of developing OHSS that is lingering and dangerous. What do you think is the most important thing a fertility patient can take from our conversation today? I can't emphasize enough from everything we talk about today. Basics are basics, but in most cases that I deal with, and I, like you, I'm pretty busy. It is the egg that is the issue. You can do a lot for the sperm. Most of it is dealt with through selecting the sperm properly and doing ICSI. And if you do that, you can get away with most. Your focus, unfortunately, needs to be more upon how to protect the eggs during the developmental process, during the cycle of stimulation. You can't make better eggs unless you write with the, with the PRP. You can make the eggs better 
using things like growth hormone may improve mitochondrial activity in the egg. And I use it liberally in all my patients I stimulate, starting at the moment, about a week or so or two before the cycle begins. I give them human growth hormone. I think it's very helpful and it doesn't do any harm for the short-term use. So I use growth hormone in combination with stimulation, but it is the protocol used for ovarian stimulation. But the important point is to use a judicious and individualized protocol aimed at avoiding overexposure to LH-induced testosterone. Another bad mistake I think, in my opinion, people make is over-dousing their patients with HCG. Because that, like LH, is only going to make more testosterone get formed in the ovary, especially if the woman has got diminished reserve. So I don't use HCG supplementation during stimulation. And I don't use testosterone supplementation that some people get given. I think that's a, a major mistake. And I try to use the birth control pill to keep the LH at bay, overlap with Lupron to get follicles, to form antral follicles, and keep the LH low, and then supplement back with some menopure to give a little bit of LH when they go onto the antagonist cycle. And using that, you get far better egg quality, you get more eggs, you get better results. And I use a lot of that because my practice is 70 or 80% women who've got diminished reserve or have failed repeatedly because of poor egg quality. And I'm sure yours is too. Yes. So is there anything else you'd like to add today? I can't think. If you've got anything in your mind, you'd no, like to show no, me. No. But I do want to say this to you because you deserve it. I think you're a wonderful doctor. And anybody who has you as a doctor is very fortunate because you give so much. Thank and you. I, it's always a privilege and a pleasure to be with you and talk to you and exchange ideas and learn from you too. Same, same. I always learn from you, always. Like, what did you say? Your egg quality is only zona deep. <laughs> um, so where can people find you and how can they work with you? If they want to reach me, they can turn around and email my assistant, Patty, and reach her by going to concierge, C-O-N-C-I-E-R-G-E, at sher, S-H-E-R-I-V-F dot com, or call her directly at 702 702- Five three three two six nine one, and Patty will always respond. Well, thank you again, Jeff. Thank you for joining me today. The information that you share is invaluable. So thank you so much. You're such a blessing to all of us around you. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm.